Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Charlie Huntington and I am the Public Relations Chairperson for Pennsylvania Bio. Pennsylvania Bio is a statewide voice of advancement for Pennsylvania's bioscience industry. Its mission is to ensure uh, the, uh, that Pennsylvania is a global leader in biosciences by creating a cohesive community uniting our biotech, medical device, healthcare IT, pharmaceutical research, and financial strengths. I want to remind our viewers that from time to time financial issues relating to life science or healthcare matters or companies may be discussed on the show. These discussions are not and should be not viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since this program is pre-recorded and shown at a later date, please keep in mind that the information may be dated. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. Here's how to send your questions to Money Matters to be answered on a future broadcast. Have your questions answered on Money Matters, please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV.com. I'm pleased to have with me tonight as my co-host, Kimmon Hatza. Kimmon is an attorney and partner with Millcrest Law in Radnor, Pennsylvania. Millcrest Law specializes in legal advice for life science, healthcare, and information technology companies. Welcome, Kimmon. Charlie, thank you very much. It's great to see you again. It's been a while since we've done the show together. It has been. <clears throat> Can you bring our viewers up to speed with what has happened within mergers and acquisitions, specifically within the medical device space? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, when I look at M&A activity or mergers and acquisitions activity in any industry, I, I like to take a, a longer view of it because uh, changes and trends are e more easily identified if you go back a few years and then bring it up to date. Um, if When I look uh, at the uh, M&A activity say 10 or 15 years ago in the medical device space, the companies that were the acquisitive companies, and they were, they were more larger companies typically, med tech companies, um, the approach was what I would call a, a fill your bag kind of approach to, to M&A. And what I mean by that is you know, a company might be in the, um, let's say, in the breast cancer space. And then they identify a device or a solution of some sort that is in the diabetes, you know, field. Okay. And so they acquire it. It has nothing to do with their core business, and there may not even be any synergies between, uh, you know, what they've acquired and what they've previously held. But they thought it was something good. It addressed a problem, so they acquired it. And then they identify yet another addressing another, you know, medical problem, and they acquire that. There was no real integration of, uh, or necessary, maybe not even a, a connection among the various things, and maybe the core business was shifting, but there was, you didn't have the kind of um, uh, connect, you know, connectivity cohesive or strategy. cohesive strategy. It just, it just wasn't there. It was sort of like, I'm identifying a lot of good things and acquiring them, but they're not necessarily you know, related to each other. You know, fast forward to you know, recent years, you know, the strategy has shifted, and although there are, there are large acquisitions going on out there, and those acquisitions may include, um, you know, devices that address a lot of different medical problems, those are really high-risk, high-reward kind of deals. And when they hit, they can be transformative for a company. But when they miss, and there's as many misses and perhaps more than there are hits, it can be devastating to a company. Um, so... Uh, there's, that activity is always going to happen, but, but I th what I'm seeing more and more of is, is a more reasoned, targeted approach to M&A activity. And what I mean by that is, let's say, let's use my diabetes example from earlier. If I, if I have a portfolio 
of devices or solutions in the diabetes space. I look at my portfolio and I say, okay, I have a hole here and I have a hole over here. I'm looking for something that's going to fill those holes. And I'm, within I'm, diabetes. Within diabetes. I'm strategic, I'm, 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 I'm careful, and I'm targeting those things because what I want to do is own this space. At the end of the day, I want somebody to say, well, if they need a diabetes solution of some sort, that's the company that has it. They own this space. They have everything that's out there mm -hmm. in diabetes. And what I'm seeing now is a, is a, is a more you know, reasoned, strategic approach to M&A than, than I've seen historically. And that's not unlike things that I've seen in other industries. I mean, I've done a lot of work for, with uh, uh, software companies, for example. And as the M&A activity matures, lots of times you see this kind of focus. Uh, and I'm, so I'm expecting to see that in the near term and, and presumably beyond. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Sure. It's with great pleasure that I want to introduce tonight's special guest. Tonight's special guest in our continuing uh, series on healthcare, life science, biotech, medical devices is Beth D'Souza. Beth is CEO of Vifont. She's worked for Johnson & Johnson, GSK, and Pfizer in several disciplines such as finance, marketing, and sales. She's a board member of Mid-Atlantic Diamond Ventures. She earned her MBA at the Wharton School and a BS in Civil Engineering from the Rio de Janeiro Federal University. She was born in Brazil. However, she's been living in the Philadelphia area where she calls home for more than 30 years. Perfect. Welcome, Beth. Delighted <laughs> to be here, Charlie. Thanks for joining us. Can you describe to our viewers, please, what is the medical problem that you're trying to solve? Charlie, if you think that only one-third of all U.S. children have had an eye examination or vision screening prior to entering school, you would be surprised. In other words, two-thirds of the children never had an eye examination before entering school. This is appalling when you think of the, uh, there is a consensus that early intervention on vis uh, vision impairment is of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. It really enhances treatments. It really um, enhances the outcome. And also, in the case of vision, it may prevent blindness. Wow. So you're, you're saying by the time a, a child reaches school age, which would be ages five, six, seven, mm -hmm. I mean, has at that time, is it too late to correct some it of this? Is, or? Uh, it may be too late, uh, Charlie. If you think that 90% of early learning development is associated with vision input or visual input, you may think or, like, uh, or uh, have a feeling that from zero, newborn, until five, that child has lost a lot of like time in terms of their early learning development. It's a lot to ask to catch up for a child. Okay, so in other words, maybe it has nothing to do with vision directly, but they're being penalized in reading, let's say, because they're not Absolutely. seeing every word. Another aspect that's very important, for example, amblyopia or lazy eyes. It's a silent disease. It's prevalent in 15 to 20 percent of, ch of children. Wow. And uh, if you delay treatment until the age of five, that treatment is much more prolonged and much more expensive. If you don't uh, intervene by the age of eight, that child may lose vision in that lazy eye. So it's something that's a serious matter, and it's compromising, if you think from another perspective, a child's future and success in life. Thank you. Tell okay. us about Vifant. Vifant. Well, I'm in love with Vifant. Uh, our mission is to uh, deliver innovative, cost-effective, uh, mobile, solutions for early uh, ident identification of vision impairment. Okay. Uh, our first product offering is Vifunds Vision Acuity app. That app is downloaded into an iPad and allow a practitioner to identify early any vision impairment for children as young as two months of age. Wow. Wow. 
So I could use an iPad or a, a trained professional. A could trained use professional can use an iPad, download to the iPad, and utilize the iPad, iPad, the tablet platform to deliver that that test. Wow. Okay. We feel that that will dramatically impact that the number of like children that will have a, a vision screening early on in on their lives. So one of the populations that I think would be uh, interested in this might be the special needs population. Absolutely. Can you, can you elaborate on and, that? Uh, and, and Charlie, if you think that uh, because we do not require in our test a uh, verbal interaction between the tester and the patient, our patient segment is verbal, nonverbal, and preverbal like patients as young as two months of age. Wow. And you also can see that translating to children who ha may have special needs, who have a very short uh, attention span, that would help them communicate better through that test. If you think also from another perspective, adults or it's, uh, senior citizens who may have a stroke and may become speech impaired, they may benefit from that test as well. So any p special population that would have difficulty in uh, communicating verbally with the tester. So I'm sure there are members of our viewing audience who are saying, wait a minute, did I just hear Beth say infants? Or so, and take, a, take someone who is two months old. That's right. How would they communicate with whoever the health care practitioner is who may be running the screening, how in the world could they communicate? Absolutely, Charlie, and the beauty of this is that we, uh, our test takes into account a normal behavior of the eye called OKN. And the, in simple terms says that the eyes will naturally behave when they see a moving target, ah. they will follow that moving target, th those moving targets. Therefore, the moment that the eyes are not like behaving like they are following those targets. That means that they cannot, the eyes are not seeing those targets. And then as a function of age, you can determine the threshold whether that's a normal behavior or not. Fascinating. It so is. you have an infant looking at an iPad that's and right. basically the, the health practitioner is going to be able to look at the eyes of the infant That's to determine right. whether it's normal or not normal. And, and it's fascinating, Charlie, because I have been with the founder, Dr. Monty Mills, who this Vifant is a brainchild of, of Dr. Mills, and you can see the child, the moment that they see the moving targets, is natural to them. They want to touch it, they want to follow. It's fascinating. Wow. Wow. Um, how is how are the issues that you want to address with your app currently being addressed in the marketplace? Very interesting uh, question, uh, and I'm going to address that from a very holistic perspective, okay. not only in terms of special needs population. Okay. Currently, you have several devices in the market that took advantage or they uh, are taking advantage of technology. They are devices that are very sleek and very effective in what they do. However, they measure risk factors, where VFUND's vision acuity um, test measures the output. It measures vision. In other words, we don't second guess by looking at risk factors. In addition to that, the current devices in the market ha uh, take, uh, for a practitioner to like administer that, those tests, it takes them 12 to 15 minutes. Why with VFUND we are estimating that we can do the test in like four minutes. So that's quite a difference when you think of the time pressure that pediatricians and other HCPs are having in terms of delivering those tests. Another like important factor is that current devices require some degree or another of verbal communication with between the tester and the patients. So that's something that we do not require. So we are hopeful that the claims that we are sharing with you right mm -hmm. today will be ones that will be proven to be correct. So, so just so I understand, with your test, you can determine in a few minutes vision, the actual the vision of the, the patient, the whereas right. the other devices that are available now, in 15 minutes to just identify risk factors, and that's not, not the necessarily the vision and itself. Well, and a very interesting aspect is with risk factors, you can have several risk factors and your vision be okay, mm -hmm. but you can also have no risk factors 
and and uh, your vision be compromised. In other words, it's not a hundred percent correlation. So that m may create problems in the healthcare system. For example, if someone is referred to an, a specialist and ended up not having anything, that was a referral that was wasted. At the same time, if you don't see any risk factors and you say the vision should be okay, because remember, many of the diseases are silent. And we have that ability in many cases of trying to adapt to that, even though the true output may be compromised. So if you think of that way, that child may have less of a chance of success if that impairment is not diagnosed earlier. What, what do you see as, as the biggest barriers to entry into the industry that this app will serve? You know? I think that the, uh, the ease of administration that okay. we will offer, also a broader like patient segment from two months up to like, uh, mm -hmm. I would say at this point, our uh, entry is going to be five years, but we have big plans to expand that as well. So I think the uh, ability for someone to really uh, be able to deliver that test in a shorter amount of time, more, more uh, economically, if mm -hmm. I say the, co the, the, uh, the cost of administering it be lo being lower, mm -hmm. I think those are going to be tremendous and important attributes of our test. Okay. Um, Talk a little bit about your partnership with Penn's PCI Ventures, if you could. Absolutely. Uh, VFUN's test acuity test, uh, vision acuity test, was one of the finalists of UPenn uh, mobile application contest. As a result of that, our like company bec became part of their portfolio of companies of Penn Center for Innovation. Uh, they are tremendous collaborators uh, with the V Fund. Michael Purcell and his team uh, provides tremendous guidance to us, tremendous infrastructure. I don't know where I would be without them. Wow. He's been a, a guest on our show and he's been very valuable in terms of consulting yes. on, on potential guests for the future. Um, so what major critical work streams do you need to address in, in, in the near term. And Charlie, I'm going to uh, uh, look at the perspective of pre-launch. Okay. okay. So first of all, funding. And if you uh, think of that this way, this is what's keeping me awake at night. Great. Uh, having enough resources to move to all the critical work streams that I need. Second one would be product development, that we are smart to really have the correct uh, product development. We have a tremendous CTO. Uh, that Anson from Brick Simple, who has been also a tremendous resource to us. We need to be smart on how we develop that product. I would say then regulatory submission, <coughs> conversation and dialogue with the FDA because we are going to be classified as a device and therefore there has to be an FDA approval. And then one thing also that has uh, kept me Concerned is that we don't have enough literature uh, in the mar on the market that would allow us to prove the cost benefit of our of our intervention. In other words, we are going to gather a lot of data to be able to prove that what we are like engaged in doing really will have a tremendous impact in the overall healthcare uh, environment ecosystem. Great, but funding is number one for me. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hold that thought because I want to come back to it. Sure. But do you think that the process that you're going to have to go through to get FDA mm -hmm. approval, will it be as difficult, less difficult, or more difficult than a comparable process for a pharmaceutical? Let's oh, say. it's much easier because we are, we, we are no invasive. In other words, there is no invasiveness at all. We are going to do no harm at all. Our test is very benign in, from that perspective. So I anticipate that once we have FDA approval, and we are able to submit everything. Mm -hmm. that, that, that will be a, a matter of once we provide all the data, four months at most for mm -hmm. them to come back with a determination or ask additional questions. Also, we anticipate that our device is going to be a class two, not a class three. That's a more stringent like process. So uh, it's much less than the billions of dollars that you spend in like developing a, a, a traditional pharma product and then the, uh, the, uh, the studies that are associated with the FDA regulatory uh, submission. Devices are usually much less uh, complex in their nature. Okay. Um, let's just let's go back to funding because sure. you are 
I would, t for me to say you're not the first guest <laughs> on this show who is who uh, who is running an early stage company to say that really funding is mm -hmm. it's sort of it's the lifeblood of your company at this stage, uh, and it's it's very difficult. It is the thing that weighs on everybody mm -hmm. all the time. How um, have you funded yourselves to date? Excellent question. We have been uh, engaging in uh, in discussions with like uh, investors, local investors to the Philadelphia area, and the uh, our product uh, and our offering has been extremely well received. And we are also submitting several grant requests, both to governmental uh, uh, agencies such as NIH, National okay. Institute of Health, as well as private entities that have grants available to mission or like or topics that they feel are, are relevant to their mission as well. We uh, obtained some seed money, and with that seed money, we started our product development this week on Monday. So I'm very pleased to see that, but that the money that we have is not enough to cover all the expenses. So funding is still in the forefront of my 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 priorities. Um, as you as you look down the road, you know how do you think you'll be able to fund yourselves? And and you identified a couple of different That's right. sources. Is there is there anything else? Collaborations with uh, third parties or anything that are options for you? I believe uh, that the first thing that we have to do, we and yes, we are thinking about collaborations, but the first thing we have to do is to prove uh, proof of concept. We are building a small prototype to allow pediatricians and uh, pediatric ophthalmologists to really understand whether what we are claiming that we can do is viable. So once that prototype and the proof of concept uh, is, is concluded, I'm f quite positive because many investors have already told me so that the, uh, the funding will start to become more natural uh, f for me to proceed with that. But collaborations such as with companies such as J&J, Alcon, absolutely, War Warby Parker, who is also a UPenn uh, grad, mm -hmm. that the founders. Okay. So that would be tremendous, and I welcome that intensely. Okay. What do you see developing over the next five years in terms of how would you gauge success if you look out five years and, and uh, sort of give us your vision, if you would? Absolutely. Uh, my vision is the following. Everyone, everyone that talks about vision impairment, and in particular with pediatric population, they will think first of a fund. Mm. It's almost like Google and searching data. Similar. You want to be a household absolutely name, Absolutely, right? I okay. want to. We have we are, have very ambitious plans for V fund. I also feel that we have other spaces that we can go. First of all, I think there is the global expansion is natural. There are so many parts of the world where this can benefit, our, uh, it, it, our task can, can benefit those children who do not have the resource to have the vision screening. That's later on. I also feel that we have several spaces that we can really benefit and impact. I mentioned the uh, senior citizens, and uh, there are 800,000 like people uh, affected by strokes in the United States, and many of them get sequela. They get speech impaired because of that. We can help those folks communicate in terms of like at least having their vision checked. I think Great. also animal health is something else that we are looking at. In the, in, in the sports arena, concussion is a big name. NIH has spent billions of dollars in terms of like uh, trying to understand how they can prevent concussion. Maybe we can help at least identify it. I have difficulty putting two leashes on two labs in the morning to walk them. I can't <laughs> imagine trying to strap glasses or uh, <laughs> you know, contacts on them. Um, the, so are you, when, when, when you look at the healthcare practitioners, mm -hmm. are you friendly fire? Are you a threat? I mean, how, how will you get the word out, typically? Oh, uh, they it have to be, uh, uh, like, partnering with us. We need to have a very, very solid story, a very strong story on how we can help them identify, uh, like, uh, early on vision impairment and how we can help them fulfill the role that they want to be uh, helping those kids early on. So I'm hearing uh, uh, earlier one of Kimmon's questions you answered, potentially less time that would take to administer the test, right. uh, potentially less expensive. Absolutely. Um, More accurate, and, potentially. And less false, fewer false positives, That's right. right? Yes. Okay, okay. 
with we have some limited time right now. Okay. Can you talk about the transition that you made from Big Pharma Beth to medic? It's a small medical device company. How? Uh, were you threatened by the prospects of that? Um, I welcomed it. You did. did. I think I prepared my entire life to be in the position, the role that I am now. I always wanted to lead a startup because it's almost like you have a, a white blank canvas in front of you right. and you can start designing it. Uh, but I also feel that one has the responsibility of uh, gathering the, uh, the uh, knowledge that you need to be in this position. So I think what I did was I prepared myself and contributed to those organizations who I was associated with very strongly, but at the same time I also received back in many ways in knowing more, becoming a better professional. And that led me to where I am today. Hmm. So it was a perfect combination, perfect timing for me. So when you look at the ecosystem in the Philadelphia area, we have a lot, 80% of the world's pharma That's is within right. 100 miles of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And there are many companies that are spun out, spun up in, into those, yes. into big pharma. Um, the advice that you give to your peers when you find a peer in transition mm -hmm. within big pharma would be what in terms of the biggest, the biggest changes of your day now versus what it was when you were part of big pharma is what? What do they need to get ready for? Do not feel afraid of being unstructured. In okay. other words, my day doesn't ha may ha not have any meetings on the day <laughs> when I start, and then at the end of the day, I, I was on the phone the whole day, I had to do things different. You're going to have to be very self-reliant because your day has no structure at all, and you have very, uh, very few resources. Well, but I love it, Charlie. That's <laughs> it, it, and it shows, and it shows. And I think uh, Penn did a great job by the, the entrepreneur that they've identified, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, any, any follow-up thoughts? No, you know, I, I don't think I had one follow-up, but I don't think we have the time for it. Well, now, we, so are, we are running out of time, <laughs> and you've done a great job. We've covered a lot of territory. And, Beth, I want to thank you for Welcome. being a, a great Delighted guest the on the show. Kimmon, yeah. thank you for being a great, pleasure. great guest host. Um, I want to remind our viewers that Money Matters is now available as an audible podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, listed as Money Matters, the podcast for mobile devices. The video is also available on our YouTube channel as well as our website. And uh, before we go, I want to let you know that next week's guest is Rhonda Costello from Republic Bank. She's going to be updating us on some of the changes within the banking industry. And as always, thank you for tuning in. And uh, we want to, to uh, uh, see you again at a later date on the show. Good night. <laughs>